Did you ever wonder why our common household pets tend to be mammalian carnivores? My favorite mammals tend to be carnivores for their fun personalities. Whether it's a dog I'm training or a house cat I'm watching in our indoor environment clawing at a scratching post. These descendants of some of the wildest and most elusive meat-eating mammals are seriously amazing. Among the 5,400 species of mammals, fewer than 300 of these species are carnivores. And they're often at the top of the food chain. From the tiniest least weasel to the enormous polar bear that can be 25,000 times the weight of that weasel. From the social meat-eating lion to the solitary bamboo-eating giant panda, the diversity in these species is incredible. Within the order Carnivora, there are 37 species of cats in four genera, 35 species of wild dogs in 10 genera, four species of hyenas, each in their own genus, only eight species of bears worldwide in five genera, 19 species of raccoons, 10 species of skunks, and 70 species of civets and mongooses. To help round out the order, there are 55 species of weasels, including the black-footed ferret, badgers, otters, sea otters, and ermines. Some of these weasel family creatures have luxurious fur that has been coveted by humans for warmth and fashion for centuries. These land-based carnivores have a worldwide distribution, except on Australia, where the native species are marsupials, and Antarctica, where there are carnivorous seals, and they're mostly water-dwelling. Finally, there are 34 species of seals, sea lions, and walruses, species which make up the clade Pinnipedia as part of the order Carnivora, distributed regionally in mostly marine ecosystems around the world. In the previous lecture, we talked about the unguligrade foot structure of the mammalian herbivores. Among the carnivores, we have digitigrade animals that walk on their toes, like cats and dogs, and plantigrade animals that walk on the soles of their feet, as we humans and bears do. Both forms share an evolutionarily distant fusion of carpal and tarsal bones. Just like last time, let's compare these adaptations to your palm, the primate palm, and what zoologists call the mid-carpal joint. Hold your hand out flat with the palm facing upward. Now bend your thumb toward your palm and see if you can touch the base of your ring finger or pinky. Notice that it's not just your thumb that moves. The lower edge of your palm is curling up too. That movement is possible because you have a series of three bones at the base of your palm. Triquetral on the pinky side, lunate in the middle, and scaphoid on the thumb side. They can move independently of one another. Carnivores have only two bones in this spot the triquetral bone, and a fused scapholunar bone. Last time we said that the fusion of ungulate bones provided for better strength and stability for running at the expense of rotation and flexibility. In carnivores, we can say something similar, that perhaps this bony fusion to form the scapholunar bone provided a compromise, a solid basis but also a bit of movement in the mid-carpal joint, which early carnivores needed to climb as well as to grapple with prey. Carnivores have relatively undeveloped clavicles or collarbones. Think about the way a house cat can squeeze into impossibly tight spaces thanks to its narrow shoulders. We omnivorous primates need a large clavicle to stabilize the lower part of the shoulder blade and to provide attachment for the muscles that control the side-to-side -side movement of our arms. Carnivores have a front-to-back swing of their limbs when running after prey, and the advantage of a long stride when running down their prey probably explains the clavicle that is free at both ends and lodged firmly within shoulder muscles. In other words, carnivores are adapted for running and have agile, powerful bodies no matter what their size. Carnivores are incredibly variable in lifestyle, and the remainder of their anatomy reminds us of this on a species-by-species -species basis. 
Anyone who has a cat knows that many cat species have retractable claws, and these are common to the whole Felidae family, but these are not common to all carnivores. Dogs and bears have digging style claws, which are non-retractal and often blunter than a cat's. But blunt doesn't mean they're harmless. Brown bears have incredibly long claws for digging up tubers, grubs, and even small mammal prey, while their closest relative, the polar bear, has sharp and more cat-like claws for gripping their icy habitat and seal prey. The standard carnivore dental formula is 44 teeth, three incisors, one canine, four premolars, and three molars on each side, top and bottom. There are differences in this basic formula between carnivore families. And wolves, for example, lack one molar on the upper jaw from this standard formula, probably to allow development of a strong carnassial tooth pairing. Carnassials are the most evolutionarily significant advance in carnivore dentition. These create a powerful cutting interface involving the last upper premolar and the first lower molar, which in carnivores have high cusps and sharp tips to shear through flesh. In our own mouths, the equivalent teeth have flat grinding surfaces. These carnassials evolved independently several times in ancient carnivores, and we see these structures in different parts of the tooth rows in fossilized specimens. The most likely ancestors of today's carnivores were probably forest living animals with a tree dwelling existence that arose somewhere between 50 and 60 million years ago. From these animals, called the Myacidae family, our modern carnivore families radiated quickly into two main branches or suborders during the Eocene and Ligocene periods 56 to 24 million years ago. One of these branches is the cat branch with the cat, hyena, civet, and mongoose families. And the other is the dog branch, which includes not only dogs, wolves, and foxes, but also skunks, weasels, raccoons, bears, and of course, sea lions, seals, and walruses. Within the dog branch, or Caniformia suborder, giant pandas are firmly established as members of the Ursidae, the bear family. However, red pandas of the Himalayan mountains, another star at Smithsonian's National Zoo, are not closely related to giant pandas, even though these species are both specialized for eating bamboo. The taxonomic position of red pandas has been debated since the early 19th century, and recent DNA analysis now places them in their own family, Eluridae. This species is most closely related to the superfamily that contains raccoons, skunks, and weasels. Within the cat branch, the Feliformia suborder, we have the cat family or Felidae. Bobcats, mountain lions, cheetahs, and other cats are also members of this family, including our domestic house cat. One member of this family, the lion, has been portrayed as king of beasts for centuries and has been portrayed from writings in the Bible to art on the walls of caves to the coats of arms of royal families. Stories about the mythical powers of lions abound from Africa to Europe and include the notions that lion parts can provide protection against enemies, cure disease, or enhance sexual capabilities. Lions, like other cats, have relatively short, powerful skulls that are adapted for killing and eating prey. And like other cats, they rely on keen vision and hearing. Their snout is short relative to dog snouts. And this indicates that smell is less important to these species than is vision. Their jaws are still strong. They are known to eat prey ranging in size from hares and rodents to wildebeest and buffalo, even rhinos and elephants at times. In fact, Lions are one of the few carnivores able to take prey greater than their own weight. The weight of female lions, the primary hunters, usually maxes out around 400 pounds and males around 550 pounds, but they can take prey weighing over 550 pounds. Lions can take down healthy adult prey as well as young, old, and infirm animals, killing the prey animal with a suffocating throat bite. 
They sometimes kill other predators like hyenas and leopards, but rarely eat them. On the Serengeti Plains, lions kill so many cheetah cubs in their lair that many cheetahs never reach adulthood. Despite their strength, lions need to be very careful while attacking. A kick from a zebra or a giraffe may mortally wound or kill a lion. Cooperative hunting by lions and their social groups or prides is common when the lions are hunting very large animals or when they are hunting in harsh environments. Hunts by single lions are more common when prey is relatively available and easy to capture, and these have less than 20% hunting success. Lions that hunt in pairs experience higher success rates, about 30%. Lions can be extremely fast over short distances, but they lack the cardiac and pulmonary capacity to be long distance runners. They can reach speeds of about 35 miles per hour, but they can only sustain them for 100 or 200 yards, maybe a little longer. Because of their lack of long distance speed, lions are most successful at hunting when they sneak to within a short distance of the prey before launching their final sprint. Some pride members remain on the sidelines during these hunts, apparently because they cannot have much impact on the hunt's success. Pride members share in the meal, with dominant animals eating first. Male lions, like many cats, are much larger than females, and their size helps them dominate other members of the pride when feeding at the carcass. In turn, females dominate subadults and cubs, and there is a lot of squabbling at the carcass. Because of the squabbling, there is no guarantee that the cubs will be able to eat, and sometimes cubs starve if food is not plentiful. After gorging themselves, lions may rest for up to a week before they try to hunt again. Lions are the most sociable of all felids and are known for their large prides of three to 10 adult females and a coalition of two to three adult males. Very large prides of up to 18 adult females and 10 adult males have also been observed. Unlike a more stable monkey group or wolf pack, the lion pride is a fission fusion society in which some individuals may spend days or weeks living on their own or in smaller subgroups before rejoining the main group. Female pride members are always closely related, but are rarely related to the males in the pride. Incoming males are often related to one another and cooperate to drive off pride males when first taking over a pride, as well as to defend the pride from other males. Male coalition behavior is so strong in lions that we see it even in coalitions of males that are not related and needed to find coalition mates that didn't grow up with same age companions in their natal group. Even these unrelated males are among the most cooperative groupings in any mammalian species. Scientists say their behavior is indistinguishable from the behavior of brothers. The larger the male coalition that rules the pride, the longer their tenure of leadership seems to be. And the longer their tenure, the more cubs they can sire. So larger coalitions father more surviving offspring than we observe from smaller coalitions. Female lions often enter estrus synchronously and usually in spring or summer. So males in small coalitions experience equivalent access to breeding females, although males in larger coalitions may be relegated to helper roles to their breeding relatives. These helpers increase their genetic contribution to future generations by helping to protect and raise their nephews and nieces within the pride. During the time a female is in estrus or heat, she may mate repeatedly. Following a gestation period of around 100 days, three or four cubs are born in a place that may be secluded from the pride. After the cubs are introduced by the lioness to the pride, they are accepted and protected by the rest of the adults in the pride. Cubs remain with the pride for 18 to 24 months, learning how to be social and how to hunt and kill on their own before they leave as coalitions of males, remain in the pride as females, or butt off the pride as a female coalition to start a pride of their own. 
large areas of land are necessary to support herds of lions' natural prey and the prides of lions themselves. This is the main reason that the long-term survival of lions is not assured. As human populations increase across Africa and agriculture spreads, native antelope and other prey decline, and lions are locally extirpated. Lions survive in national parks and local reserves, and we need to ensure that these areas are protected for the future of African wildlife. Aristotle mentioned lions in Greece over 2,000 years ago, but this king of all beasts is now extinct in Europe. Hopefully, modern conservation efforts can keep lions in Africa from going the way of those long ago European lions. The lion's closest relative is the tiger. Although the savannah dwelling lion has a simple tan coat and the tiger has its famous striped coat, both provide camouflage in the species' preferred habitat. I once got to experience the tiger's power of camouflage firsthand. I was in the steamy jungle of Malaysia when I was suddenly surrounded by the most pungent odor I have ever smelled. Every hair on my body stood up in a reaction that was the most primal I have ever experienced. I slowly backed down the road looking for any sign of the wild creature in the thick underbrush. When I returned to Malaysia's Biodiversity Center, my Malaysian colleagues listened to my story and then said, we have a saying in Malaysia, you never see a tiger, you only smell a tiger. I thought they were joking until they produced camera trap photos from there days later, and the camera had captured a female tiger and her cubs walking in the very spot where I felt I was being watched. Tigers are silent, powerful and agile hunters with powerful paws and claws, strong jaws, and sharp teeth. And Amur tigers are the largest members of the cat family. The tiger is the only big cat with striped fur, a camouflage coat that allows it to blend in remarkably well with its forest habitat. Scientists from Smithsonian and elsewhere have classified tigers into several subspecies from the southern tropical islands of Bali and Java, through Sumatra, Malaysia, and India, and to the Amur or Siberian region of the Russian Far East. The Siberian tiger's large body size and short legs help it retain body heat in its cold climate. The hoofed animals of Siberia are also relatively larger than in other habitats, so large body size helps Amur tigers capture prey. Tiger habitat is characterized by thick forest cover, access to water, and good populations of large ungulate prey. Tigers used to roam areas of forested habitat and now are reduced to separated islands of habitat from India to the Russian Far East. They hunt around dawn and dusk and specialize in large game like deer, boar, and other hoofed animals. Adult tigers defend large territories from other tigers of the same sex. The resource defended in female territories is primarily food because a female needs to have enough prey to feed herself plus a litter of growing cubs. A male's territory overlaps multiple female territories, so he has the additional resource of multiple females to mate. Male territories are always larger than female territories. The territory size is always based on local prey base. For instance, in the prey-rich tropics, female territories might only be eight or 10 square miles. At the other extreme, in the cold Siberian habitats of the Russian Far East, where deer and boar are at low density, the territories of Amur tigers average over 200 square miles. In both areas, male territories are proportionally larger. Like their cousins, the lions, tigers are under significant threat. Three of nine tiger subspecies have already been declared extinct after tiger populations plunged by over 90% during the last 100 years, from over 100,000 tigers at the beginning of the 20th century to fewer than 4,000 in the wild as of 2016. Threats to tigers include traditional Chinese medicine, or TCM, whose practitioners value tiger bone and other parts 
for a variety of medicinal uses, just as other cultures value the body parts of lions. One of the great joys of watching the big cats, whether on film or in a zoo, is seeing aspects of their behavior that remind us of our own domestic house cats. Watching them rub their cheeks and chins on each other as a sign of affection, or more accurately, a form of scent marking saying, you're mine. Watching them groom themselves with their tongues, watching them chase their tails or each other's, watching them stalk their prey. And believe it or not, if you give a big cat a big cardboard box, yep, he'll try to sit in it. The same holds true for the wild members of the canid family and our domesticated dog. I bet that most, if not all of us, have watched the behavior of foxes, coyotes, and most especially wolves, and thought how dog-like they are. We particularly see this in wolves, and that's because the modern wolf species hasn't changed very much from the ancient wolf that is the most probable common ancestor of modern wolves and domestic dogs. All members of the canid family evolve for rapid, long-term pursuit of prey, which is evident in their long legs and digitigrade feet with non-retractile claws. The smallest canid, the fennec fox of Africa, is adapted for harsh desert environments where prey are scarce, while the largest canids, the wolves, are found in habitats with abundant prey. The earliest known archeological evidence for domestication of canids comes from a single canine jawbone discovered in a human double grave dating back 14,000 years. Similar finds from elsewhere in Europe and the Near East date to between 8,000 and 11,000 years ago. This means that dogs were domesticated long before any other animal and even before humans developed plant agriculture. And that's just the conservative estimate. DNA evidence suggests that domestication may have begun 100,000 years ago. We suspect that hunter-gatherers started the domestication process by capturing young, wild wolves as pets, then deliberately using them as guards or as hunting partners. The result, of course, are the hundreds of domestic dog breeds on Earth now. While tame wolves, or dogs, have become our best friends, wild wolves have been hated and persecuted because they sometimes hunt farm animals and compete with humans for deer and other game species. Wolves really can kill large numbers of domestic animals, but their threats to humans are largely overrated and the stuff of fairy tales. Like domestic dogs, wolves are social canids, and they travel in packs that can overcome animals as large as moose or bison with their sheer numbers. Pack size is usually five to eight wolves and can be over two dozen animals. The pack is a bonded pair of breeding animals and their dependent offspring and subadults. The breeding pair helps to direct the activities of the pack by teaching the jun junior animals how to hunt and survive and encouraging good social behavior and bonding among members of the pack. Wolves are found across the Northern Hemisphere and once had one of the largest ranges of any Northern Hemisphere animal. They're extremely adaptable and have been found in a variety of habitats from deserts to wetlands to forests. By the mid 20th century, wolves were endangered in the lower 48 United States and they were reintroduced into Yellowstone National Park and other large park areas starting in the 1990s. In the 20 years since wolves were reintroduced to the Yellowstone ecosystem, this national park went from zero wolves to one of the highest densities of wolves in the world. This reintroduction wasn't just for the benefit of the wolves. It was intended to benefit the entire ecosystem. Wolves are considered a keystone species. They like other apex predators, help to control their prey species so have large effects on the environment in which they live. Wolves and other keystone species influence their ecosystems directly and indirectly, controlling numbers of their prey, prey that otherwise have effects on the plant and animal species in the trophic levels below them in the food web within that ecosystem. 
When wolves were extirpated in the American West, their elk prey populations expanded and used creek areas where they ate much of the vegetation, removing shade from over the creek and thereby increasing the temperature of the creeks. This disruption of ecological processes resulted in increased creek temperatures that reduced the numbers of trout and other cold water fish in the creeks. These top-down effects show how important apex predators can be for the health of their ecosystems. When wolves were returned to the Yellowstone ecosystem, they influenced the numbers, distribution, and behavior of elk and their other prey, and this influenced the other animals living there, which altered the landscape of Yellowstone itself. When elk moved away from the creekside to avoid wolves, trees grew back, shaded the creeks, cooling the creeks, and the end result was more trout in the cooler waters. And not just more trout, as the ecosystem was restored to a more natural state, researchers found more songbirds in the creekside vegetation and elsewhere, more birds of prey, and even more pronghorn across the landscape. Even other predators and carrion eaters, like ravens, bears, coyotes, and so on, benefited from scraps left behind at wolf kills. The study of this trophic cascade has made it clear that when one element of an ecosystem is changed, the cumulative effects of that change may not be immediately apparent, but these effects may be deep and profound for the ecosystem. When it comes to apex predators, I have to admit I have some favorites. I'm just crazy about bears. My love for bears started when I was a kid in the Adirondack Mountains of New York State, where I could often see black bears grazing in berry patches. I have worked with bears both in zoos and in nature for decades. There are eight species of bears. They are adapted to a variety of habitats and diets, and their size shows it. The American and Asian black bears, brown bears, and South American Indian bears are all omnivores that eat plants, fruits, and small animals or bird eggs. The polar bear evolved most recently from salmon-eating brown bears, and polar bears are seal specialists. The tropical sun bear is the size of a retriever and is specialized for eating fruits of the forest. The Asian sloth bear is well adapted to eating insects like termites. It has evolved a space between its front teeth where its incisors were, so it can suck insects up like a vacuum cleaner. What a way to obtain food. The giant panda, as we know, is an herbivorous bear that is specialized for eating bamboo. Among all these species, polar bears are the largest. In fact, they're the largest terrestrial carnivores on the planet, but their size and strength has not protected them from habitat loss. Polar bears are currently classified as vulnerable with fewer than 20,000 remaining in the wild and declining relatively quickly. The loss of Arctic sea ice is the culprit. The bears typically stalk their seal prey by locating and waiting by holes in the Arctic sea ice. Seals use these isolated holes to come up for breath, and when they do, the polar bears nab them. If the ocean is mostly water and very little ice, then the bears cannot predict the location of their prey and they're forced onto land to seek other food sources, including larger, more dangerous animals like muskoxen and reindeer. Individual polar bears are surviving the loss of sea ice, learning to hunt for crustaceans and geese, even eating grass and berries from time to time. But they need the high fat content of seals to truly survive and thrive. The polar bear isn't alone in these sorts of struggles. Mammologists from the International Union for Conservation of Nature believe that almost one quarter of our world's mammals are threatened with extinction. And we know that carnivores like black-footed ferrets, cheetahs, tigers, and polar bears are in the most trouble. Dwindling habitat due to habitat destruction by human actions, persecution as killers of domestic livestock, and exploitation for fur or bones for medicinal purposes are the main reasons that carnivores are threatened by humans. We need to come to terms with our human views of these mammals. Is a tiger or wolf 
the most aesthetically stunning animal on the planet? Or is it a dreadfully ugly killer of people? Is it a useful natural predator that helps with deer control? Or is it a vicious killer of sheep and cows? Is it a pile of medicinal bones or a luxuriant coat to be harvested? Or is it worth more alive as a driver of ecotourism? Thoughtful management in wild areas is the best conservation action for carnivores since they need wild places and wild prey. The indiscriminate killing of predators by aerial gunning of wolves or indiscriminate poisoning of coyotes or foxes needs to be replaced with compassionate conservation and acknowledgement of the roles these animals play in our ecosystems.